Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome. I am Lauren Gates, your host of tonight's Airway Health Solutions Conversation, featuring the fabulous Dr. Susan Maples, who will be joining us any second. We just had a technical difficulty, but I like to start on time. So I was just going to go ahead and read her bio. And by the time I finish with that, she'll be right back with us. So um, Dr. Susan Maples is a passionate health educator and leads a successful total health insurance independent dental practice in Holt, Michigan. She brings preventative and restorative dental expertise of passion for mouth uh, body total health. And she has a master's degree in business marketing. That's super impressive. And 30 plus years of experience in private practice. Susan currently serves as president of the American Academy of Oral Systemic Health and she is the creator and founder of Total Health Academy, a complete online solution for dental teams to integrate all aspects of total health dentistry and developer of the hands-on learning lab and selfscreen.net. She is the author of Blabbermouth, 77 Secrets Only Your Mouth Can Tell You to Live a Healthier, Happier, and Sexier Life. And Susan just published, as we all know, a brand new book titled Brave New Parent, um, I'm a big fan. Can't wait to talk a little bit about that. Uh, raising happy, healthy kids against all odds in today's world, which, as you know, is published now. So I'm just waiting any moment for Dr. Maples to join us. Um, I know she was having some trouble sharing her screen. But meanwhile, if you wanted to go ahead and write any questions, you can use our Q&A box. We do have plenty of questions. Thank you for entering them in the registration. And I will also read a really exciting medical disclaimer. So hang in there, we're almost done. The content presented is not intended to be a substitute for professional, dental, or medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician, dentist, or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Okay, well, while we're waiting, I don't know if anyone has had the chance to read Brave Parent, but you know it's funny because before the call, Susan had asked me if I just skipped over to chapter four and chapter five on the breathing and the sleep. And, and luckily I didn't. I actually started with the preface, which I highly recommend everybody reads because it's really touching. Hi, Dr. Maples, you just have to get you off of mute. But I'm just, I'm just bragging about you and how I was just so... Um, I dove right in with the preface and you just got me at hello, basically, with your story and how you really just walk the walk, talk the talk, but you make the path brighter for everyone else. And just wanted to thank you. And now officially welcome. So welcome to you know, Mabel. You know, many of us are, I go by Susan. Thank you so much, Lauren. No problem. You know, so many of us are paying it forward. Many of us uh, in the airway space have our own personal story. You know, until we get to a point where people just want to do this because it's expected and it's a good thing to do, but many of us have these powerful personal stories, right? Right, right. Well, it was funny when we um, designed this talk a couple of months ago, like, well, there's so many things to talk about and we both decided it would be really great to kind of hone in on the impact of allergies on pediatric airway disorders because I don't think it gets the attention it deserves and now I see a little bit more why you're so passionate about that from your story. So why don't you tell us a little bit, I don't wanna give away your book, but, but how it impacted you as a child um, so much and how you are now able to pay that forward. Well, I was actually raised um, in a household of heavy, heavy smoke. My parents smoked two packs a day each. My mom actually uh, was a one pack a day smoker until she got pregnant with me. Her doctor told her it would relax nervous moms if she increased her smoking. Oh my gosh. She had a baby in arms and she got pregnant right away. She was nervous. And um, so I was born with, um, you know, premature lungs and in, in an oxygen tent. And um, I ended up developing 53 allergies and hospitalized um, after I went through that initial three months. Later, I was hospitalized seven more times for pneumonia under the age of 12. So I, um, my allergies were a real problem, but that is not the reason I'm writing or talking about this tonight. In the research for Brave Parent, I learned a lot about uh, microbiome deficiency. You know, the book goes is not just an airway book, right? It's not just mm -hmm. a nutrition book. It's an everything book. It's all the contemporary issues that we grapple with today. And one of them is that our microbiome 
the bugs we carry with us, which are 10 to one to human cells, mm -hmm. um, are 50% uh, less diverse than they were 50 years ago, which is really accounting for a lot of our um, health decline, non-communicable non disease rate, autoimmune problems, all of that. And it occurred to me that of course, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about it when we get into the program, but you know, the mouth is supposed to be the backup valve and we use it when we can't breathe through our nose. And what often causes congestion is allergies. Mm -hmm. So if we're trying to fix things, you know, dentists are very mechanical. We're trying to do expansion and get the tonsils out of the way and look at this as a mechanical object. We have to also understand that congestion, chronic congestion has to be dealt with on a root cause basis. And that's something that we're not good at because we're not functional medicine doctors. We're not integrated medicine doctors. We're not allergists. We're not pediatricians. And so being aware that it could be a food or environmental allergy that sets a child up for mouth breathing, mm -hmm. that then shapes the tongue box to be something permanently disfiguring or dysfunctioning right. is a problem. And I love that you refer to it as the tongue box, you know, um, growing the tongue box. It's the shape of things to come. I love that. That was Thank very you. clever. <laughs> very clever. The title so, of the um, right. Right. So why don't we go ahead? I know you have a lot of great information. I'm going to go ahead and share your screen and tell us a little bit about the um, allergies specifically. And then we have plenty of time for Q&A as well. All right. I'll, I'll talk for about 20 minutes as you yeah, that would be great. Eight. Okay. I called so it this all, all stuffed up and nowhere to blow. Do you like that? <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> so um, what did, did you have a presentation you wanted to share? Yeah, I, I'm sure sharing it. Does it show? No, not yet. So try again and just be very mindful of that whiteboard. Yeah, no, it's the whiteboard <laughs> okay. is not an issue right now. Okay, um, cool. I'm just trying to share the screen. And it see. is. So let's see if I can share it. Is that showing up? Yep, there we go. All right. Then let me, um, let me see if I can move this in order to play. Okay. Can you see that? Yep, perfect. All right. All stuffed up and nowhere to blow. Love it. Role of allergy and pediatric airway dysfunction. I wrote, I, I, it's a privilege for me, by the way, to be able to speak to a small specific area in airway because. I'm speaking to an airway astute audience tonight. Thank you to you for attracting oh. these people. Oh, I mean, this is not pleasure. an elementary audience, the people that take their time out at eight o'clock at night to, to go on in this particular area. So I And just so you know, we have over 200 registrants. A lot of people couldn't make it, but they nice. do listen to the recording. So yeah, thank nice. you. Yeah. So um, I've been busy. This is a disclaimer. I've just been busy creating a lot of tools to help uh, general and pediatric dentists get um, better at this total health arena. And my first book, Blabbermouth 77 Secrets, Only Your Mouth Can Tell You to Live a Healthier, Happier, Sexier Life is about adults. And Brave Parent is really about children. Although what you realize when you read it is it's really for everyone because, you know, many times we're parenting ourselves. And, you know, every time we point a finger at our kids or anyone else, we have three pointing back at us. You know, we are not healthy either. I, you know, none of us are as healthy as we really want to be. So a lot of this is how do we deal in today's world with the challenges that we have? Um, this is my beautiful team. And I always like to give tribute to them because they really do incredible work in this area of, um, of prevention. But here I am as a little girl and um, my mom is there smoking right next to me. You wouldn't see this too, too often today. And as I mentioned, my uh, health concerns led me to, um, you know, I sort of overcame a, a bunch of odds with the help of a really, really brave physician who helped me and you hear my story in the book. But um, I think that it is against all odds in today's world that we raise healthy kids. Most kids, most adults I see who are unhealthy were sick kids to begin with. And um, for me, um, this is an upstream effort. Um, and I, I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in just a moment. But um, you know, I'm going to focus in on this chapter three, which is digest, which is mm -hmm. supporting the guts, the bugs in your kid's gut or, and on their skin and in their mouths and in their noses. Um, and then chapter four, which is breathe the, as you mentioned, growing the tongue box. And then chapter five is sleep and sleep related breathing disorders. So this kind of plays right into that, but I want to pull this out and show you that 
today I had a two adult new patients and my new patient exams are two hours to two and a half hours long. So I have a really nice, rich time to sit and just be with a patient. And today I had a 39 year old man who was you know, among other things, had non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, drank, was, went from two gallons of Mountain Dew to 20 ounces, had obstructive sleep apnea and kidney stones and uh, brain fog and all kinds of other issues. And, you know, every, he, this kid was a sick kid growing up, but he didn't have the benefit of what we know now. And he didn't have the dentist that I am. He didn't have a physician or a parent really helping him. So a lot of times, you know, for me, sitting in the role of a general dentist, working with chronically ill patients, what I really want to do is be five miles up the river while they, you know, there was an urban legend told of a guy, a couple of guys having a picnic on the side of the river, and uh, they see this drowning child go by, and they jump in to save this child, but before they're finished, there's another one, and then two more, and then three more, and finally, one of the guys gets out of the river, and he's, he literally, uh, you know, dries off and the guy goes, where are you going? You're leaving me. And he goes, I'm going upstream to figure out what's going on. How are these kids falling in the river? So this is a real upstream effort. I just finished this book that I loved by Dan Heath called Upstream is how do we get involved earlier? And this is what really led me um, along with my own um, journey of childhood illness that, you know, was aided by a surrogate brave parent, my, my physician at the time. This is a group of us who are studying in the international pediatric airway space. We, we, we meet once a month and you'll recognize a lot of names on here. I'm sure you've had a lot of these people speaking with you. Steve Carsonson and Kevin Boyd and Howie Hinden and Sherry Moore and Lauren Ballinger and Bill Hang and Mariana Evans. And you know this has been an amazing group to work with. These We're trying to raise awareness throughout the world for um, this continuum, which is we begin with healthy sleep um, and unless you're a syndrome kid or a premature kid and you end up with severe obstructive sleep apnea, this is really a continuum. And the upper airway resistance syndrome, which is something I could talk about another time, Lauren, I think is showing up a lot in kids, the efforts to breathe that result in breathing that don't register on, um, on a polysomnogram. And what do we do when we start to see some of these signs? But this is what we end up with with adults. We end up with the retreated face and the tongue blocking the airway and um, an airway that never developed um, enough to keep an open airway at rest when all of our muscles are paralyzed during REM sleep. And so the tongue position becomes a real problem and we start to um, start to have deformation. It's a real uh, epidemic or pandemic in Westernized culture today in that 26% um, of us have sleep apnea and only 4% know it. But we're gonna start with an infant and look at why do we end up mouth breathing instead of nose breathing? Because we're all aware that 24 seven nasal breathing and quiet breathing is essential for health and for facial and what we call the cranial facial respiratory development or growth and development. There's magic in the nose that we don't have in the mouth, right? That we are, we all know that the nose warms, humidifies, cleanses, and purifies the air. And without it, we end up in trouble. But when we start to use the backup valve, the mouth, which is there for emergency breathing, we start to use it all the time or habitually. Then what we get is what we call nasal disuse. That's the concept that if you don't use it, you lose it. The nose, for whatever reason, it's more of a phenomenon than it is a real, we don't really understand the pathogenesis of that. The turbinates become inflamed. We develop more mucus and um, more congestion and the nose becomes less usable. And if there's anyone that showed this, it was Nestor in his book when he put those plugs in his nose and went through, you know, everybody has read breath, I hope, uh, because the public has certainly read it. So, um, it is, it's a real problem. And we often don't stop to think about that congestion in the nose. If your nose is plugged, because I often ask parents, you know, does your child mouth breathe? And they say only when they're sick or congested. And we leave it at that instead of saying, how often is that? Right. right? The chronicity of that creates a necessity for them to open their mouth and start to breathe through their mouth. And it could be a chronic cold. I mean, I'm sorry, it could be just like a, a common cold that at the end of the cold, the child has a habit of mouth breathing. 
I mean, it could be that fast or it could be something really chronic like allergies, right? Um, but what we know from Guimano, Christian Guimano said, mouth breathing ultimately ends up with abnormal oral facial growth. And Suresh Zaghi did, did a sort of a, his own rendition of this, which I like quite a lot. And again, mouth breathing leads to abnormal oral facial growth. So this we know, this is well documented. So when we look at mouth breathing and we look at the role of the tongue, whether it's from uh, a tongue tie where the tongue can't create a, a posterior um, oral resting posture upward, or we look at you know, the mouth being slack open and the facial muscles collapsing the upper arch, any of these things cause a child who is born with a little tiny face and a little tiny head, 25 to 30% of their adult size, mm -hmm. that by two years old is already at 80%. That two years is really hard because we don't really get cooperation for um, uh, myofunctional therapy. I mean, it's difficult, right? We don't know how to talk. We can't receive feedback from them. We can't tell what's working. We can't say, close your mouth. They don't understand. So this is a critical time. And, um, and I, I love the fact that we have these Bolton norms to look at. So instead of having the true face that this little girl deserves and needs to hold her tongue out of her airway for the rest of her ever loving life, we end up with this mid facial collapse. And so it's really important to me that we think about the nose as much as the mouth, because if the nose isn't useful, we're in trouble. We're going to have a face that looks retreated. So we have to look at that. Now, I'm not going to play this video. I'll start the video so you, you can recognize it when you see it. Ramirez does a beautiful job. And I love this for parents because it really does The normal explain. or physiological way of breathing is through your nose. Breathing through the nose permits to purify the air by the structures inside the nasal cavity. In that way, the air entering into your nasal and oropharynx You've seen this throat, one, right? is not yeah. going to have and many of us have. And I want to I wanted to bring it to your attention because it's literally like a two and a half minute video or something that shows parents how it happens that mouth breathing creates this craniofacial sacral collapse or dysfunction, mm -hmm. dysfunctional growth. Um, but what else does mouth breathing do? It, uh, because we're filtering the, the air uh, through our mouth, we're relying on the lymph tissue to um, exploit or expand the adenoids and tonsils. And that further crowds the posterior pharynx. And so we've always thought, or I've always felt like we wanna treat the habits, the habits that create this, uh, thumb sucking and pacifiers, which basically thwart the growth of the maxilla by pushing back and also forming the tongue, pushing up on a, a foreign object and forming a, a misshapen palate. And then guided growth through um, orthopedic like expansion and also uh, myofunctional therapy, and then ultimately orthodontics increasing in age. But now I've really started looking at this as a stage there where we need to identify allergens and treat those as well, or at least identify them and try to help because allergy identification, we can do fairly early on and ongoing. And we as dentists and hygienists can, can start asking some interesting questions about this. This is my pediatric ENT and my um, hygienist, Sarah, who is a myofunctional therapist talking to us about adenoids and tonsils. But I only showed this picture because this woman on the right with the arrow across her, her body right there is the one whose daughter we're going to talk about right now. And she um, got interested in myofunctional therapy because, of course, she had, um, you know, a, a personal experience, too. It was her daughter that we identified her problem at an infant oral health exam. And this is Paige. Her symptoms were, you know, were unbelievable. And her clinical signs were also unbelievable. This is the child doomed from the start when you look at her symptom. Chronic running nose, chronically ill, bedwetting, daytime sleepiness, always cranky, night sweats, mouth breathing, defiant behaviors. And when we looked in there, we see all the physical signs. And I saw this on the infant oral health exam that took place at about, I think she was 13 months, which we like to keep it between six and 12 months. But Sarah took a job with me and we brought her little girl in. It was like, oh my gosh, 
And you can see even the dark circles under her eyes from the, the uh, pressure of this, you know, and the phenoid plexus and the, um, and the, and the venous pooling under her eyes. Um, but she was chronically ill. And this is what her tonsils look like, right? And so, of course, she cannot breathe well. Even through her mouth, she struggled right at night. So she just didn't sleep well, which means she had, you know, a lack of, um, you know, brain development. And uh, she had behavioral issues from being chronically tired, which we know what that feels like. Um, and all kinds of other problems. Here's Sarah talking about it. My first identification of my daughter's obstructive airway was having Dr. Susan do an infant oral health exam and having the sole factor of looking into her airway and noticing that her tonsils were enlarged and that she was a mouth breather. From there, we investigated further with an appointment with ENT and she was too young. We were turned away. Further in a year down the road, we continued to see a decline in her house. She was not sleeping. She had um, stopped growing. And from that, um, I pushed forward and became a huge advocate and started reading more. And alongside of having the partnership with our community and working with medical physicians and um, specialists, I was really, really able to gain momentum in um, saving Paige's life. So we pushed forward and we got uh, tonsils out. And this is one week after the tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy. And she was young to be able to do that, but we pushed forward and said, she needs this. And she did. And you know that we start to see a real, um, I love this slide that I got from Steve Carsonson about the cost of medical care going down two years following the tonsils and adenoidectomy. But as we also know, this is not the end of the problem, is it? Because while we're opening the airway and allowing a child to sleep or to breathe better, we also realized that the tonsils and adenoids were a reaction to the problem. So taking away the crowding is one thing, but we haven't fixed the problem. And so we have to really dig deeper and uncover more layers about why it was we, we had the mouth breathing to begin with. And so I looked at this little girl and she had a chronic stuffy nose. And when we look at that, you know, how frustrating it is to constantly be sucking snot, they cannot breathe through their nose. What do you do with a baby with a chronic stuffy nose? Why is it happening? Well, could it be from a cold or influenza, like COVID or a flu? Could it be that she stumbled, in, stumbled into a bad habit? Could it be from allergies or anatomical blockages like overgrowth or a hypertrophy of the turbinates themselves? Or could it be from nasal disuse, as we talked about before? Again, if we don't use it, we lose it. So we always need to look up the nose. We look for it like this, a deviated septum. We look for um, blockages. We look for patency or open black holes. Um, and we look at radiographs and we look at sinus blockages and we look at the density of those sinus cavities. I love this new study that's about to be um, published by Becca Bacco and uh, Audrey Yoon and the impact of palatal expansion, the size of the tonsils and adenoids. It turns out that if maybe instead of avoiding taking those out, we can do pediatric expansion, which significantly shrinks the tonsils and adenoids, just again from bring, making the tongue box bigger. But when we look at allergies, asthma, and autoimmune disorders, those have been increasing incredibly. In fact, um, from Let's see, 2000, from 1997 to 2001, we had a 50% increase in allergies. In, uh, keep in mind, this is such a, a blink of an eye in the history of the human race that we're increasing these allergies astronomically in children. And um, so we have a lot to consider. I want you to look at her. Apple, apple. Look at her eyes. She's breathing through her mouth while she's eating. Her nose is completely plugged up. That, my friends, is what you're looking for, right? That is nasal congestion. And of course, she has to breathe through her mouth. She can hardly taste that apple because she's breathing and eating at the same time. We do get some benefit from xyl xylitol, and we're also seeing some real promise from erythritol coming up, upward on the market. You know, we can use this to reduce inflammation nightly, and we can also you know, in extreme congestion, be rinsing kids, even at little age, uh, at a young age. This is Kelly Richardson, you know, Kelly, this is her little boy, Finn, showing us how it's done. 
nose with the nose with the grin making marks. Make sure to use this sinus rinse. That's Neil Med sinus rinse. The skilled what what? I love this little guy. Let's do it, he says. So he does this before bed oh, to open his. As easy as that. That's it. <laughs> she just wrote a book, and I don't know if you've seen it yet. It's it's actually not published yet, but it's so cute. The very stuff he knows. Aww. Gets to take a place in this arena, teaching him how to make a better habit of closing his mouth and breathing through his nose. And it is a wonderful little book. But anyway, when we look at why is this allergy happening, we look at the pediatric microbiome deficiency in the gut. We have 50% fewer families of bugs living in our gut than we did 50 years ago. And it is a real problem. You know, in COVID, we've all tried to sanitize everything, which is not helping. We have 10 to one bacteria, I'm sorry, 10 to one viruses and one to one bacteria. In other words, 11 to one more bugs living in us and on us than our human cells. And we want a vast diversity of bugs whenever in any environment, whether it's mountains or trees or forests or rivers or oceans, when you start to decrease the diversity, you see overgrowth. That's why we see candida in the mouth, right? That's why we see the red tide in the ocean. It's a bloom of bacteria that's take, taking advantage. And so when we look at this um, real reduction from C-sections and antibiotics and, um, and over sanitizing our world and washers and dryers and, and um, hot dishwashers and not playing outside, all of these things have decreased our diversity. But the number one reason our microbiome is 50% less is because we have restricted the diversity of the foods that we eat. 75% of our foods today come from only 12 species of plants and five species of animals. And our C-section rates are like at 37% or something ridiculous. It's way higher than it should be. Um, and our antibiotic history is out of control. And 80% of our antibiotics come from the meat and the cheeses that we eat because these livestock animals are basically fed antibiotics to fatten them up. So we need to get kids back to um, early feeding of allergens. Now, it, our number one allergens for food allergies for kids are wheat, eggs, milk, milk, peanuts, tree nuts, shellfish, strawberries, sesame, and soil and soy. And while that's a really big list, what we do know is that um, we used to, in like the year 2000, the American Academy of Pediatrics said that we should delay all of these things until later, like cow's milk shouldn't be introduced till age one and eggs till age two and shellfish and nuts age three. Well, guess what? That did nothing but hurt the situation. So now they've really flip-flopped and said in 2000, the pendulum, um, or 2008, the pendulum swung back and said, uh, the American Academy for Allergies, um, Asthma and Immunology said that we wanna start to introduce these allergens four to six months as soon as a child's starting to eat one at a time in small amounts right after we're starting to introduce our first veggies and first meats. So we're really starting with the allergens and you can see there's a, maybe a wheat noodle there. Um, so we're starting to introduce these allergens earlier in hopes that that will help. But you know what? This is our time to organize our, you know, when we're eat, feeding kids whole foods um, the book has all these pull quotes in them. Um, and I, I believe it is our time to take our fridge, refriger, refrigerator, freezer, and pantry by storm and own them. We need to teach parents about baby led weaning, about eating whole foods, about avoiding um, almost everything except for water and some milks. You know, um, dairy is a big uh, allergen, but we can introduce it slowly and in small amounts. And certainly there's some nut milks and other things that can be beneficial. But this is where we often take kids when we have to intervene at this age, it's a little more of a problem, which is true for this little page because by the time uh, she was a very fussy eater, didn't have an easy time swallowing. And by the time we started working with her with the food pillars, which are in the book, um, 
you know, she was able to get here within about eight months. So watch this little video. By the way, this little girl literally grew up on Annie's mac and cheese and tater tots and applesauce. So whatever she would eat. And this is what we hear a lot from these kids that are cranky and stuffy and not eating well. And here she is. Pastor Susan, I'm eating asparagus, pasta salad, and peppers. Is, that's not pasta salad. What kind of salad? Is it just salad? I'm eating asparagus, <laughs> salad, and peppers for dinner. How is it? It's so good. It's so good? Hey, I love you, bye. I love you, bye. <laughs> so through working with the food pillars that I had developed when my son was young, and you heard the story in there about how I worked with that pediatric nutritionist. And I mean, it's, it's amazing how you can get kids to preference. It's called neuroplasticity. We all start mm -hmm. to prefer the things that we habitually eat. And so here's the food pillars. You don't need to screenshot them. You can get them right on the Be a Brave Parent website. And this is a thank you from, from Sarah, her mom, about working with her. But if you want to go to beabraveparent.com, you can download the food pillars and you can have it for your patients or your kids or put it on your refrigerator. And it makes a really big difference. So that's been fun. If you're interested in learning more about these microbes and how to increase and uh, flourishment, by the way, you know, uh, having dogs in your house and enforcing outdoor play and not over sanitizing everything and not using hand sanitizers and alcohol sanitizers and um, antimicrobial soaps. These are all ways that we can help kids develop a healthy microbiome um, all over their body. And so if you wanna learn more about that, I love this book, Let Them Eat Dirt, how microbes can make your child healthier. And this one more on all ages of how to reverse the overuse of antibiotics um, and what our missing microbes are. But we, you know, I grew up like this and I know a lot of kids are, you know, we consider safer play, indoor play at a tablet, but it's not safer, is it really? And we need to kind of enforce playing outside instead of playing inside. So um, again, how soon can your baby meet your pup? Now they say the younger, the better. That, you know, early exposure to dogs decreases allergies and eczema by 30% and asthma by 20%. Why is that? Because dogs carry the outside in. So when your kid nuzzles up against your dog, they're getting a lot of that microbiome, especially if they're not playing outside on their own. Um, another big problem is that we choose to, that pediatricians choose to treat this with drugs, Claritin and Flonase being the most. So, you know, we have, you know, this whole steroid um, uh, prote protection of protection of the body is not protection at all. So we start to see this as a Band-Aid and not getting at the real problem. We did, of course, look at her profile, look at her eyes. We did, of course. Okay, just tell me what does it feel like to wear your new appliances? So we did expand her and we did do the dentist thing, which is to create the expansion, shrink the, the tonsils and adenoids. And this was literally just in a few months, that level of expansion. Mm -hmm. And um, here she is doing a lot better. And we did myofunctional therapy, of course. And there's her profile even in just a short time. And now she's just flourishing um, and doing better and sleeping better, which has reduced her obesity and um, just helped in a lot of ways. So I really encourage all of you, start before age one, really build a really nice infant oral health exam where we can help people. Uh, Carries disease is 100% avoidable and 100% preventable. We need to help uh, parents learn about reducing transmissibility of strep mutans through spit. And we need to really talk to them about, about food and about sugar and do airway evaluations and have them watch for snoring and audible breathing and mouth breathing and, and all the rest. We can talk to them about, you know, when they're getting a little older about what we can do to fix this um, between communicating with a child about closed mouth and some mouth taping and some malfunctional therapy always, always doing pediatric airway exam. And I hope that you're using a pediatric health history for general dentists who are not seeing kids and maybe um, a screening tool or two on sleep disordered breathing and airway dysfunction. So if I can help you with that, um, I'd be happy to. I like to, when I'm communicating to their physicians, separate the symptoms they're experiencing, just like I did with Paige, what the parent reports in terms of symptoms and then the physical signs of what it is that I see when I look in the mouth, the nose, the back of the throat and the crowding. And then again, 
record and report, record it in your chart notes and write letters. By writing letters to their physicians that they are required to see, we are literally expanding their minds and helping them see our role in pediatric airway, but also how they can look at kids a little bit differently. Creating these co-referral relationships with our medical community enhances our practice so much. And for children, these are the list of the people that we have, and you, you only need one in every category uh, to be able to make a personal relationship with and to refer back and forth. And these make a big difference because we cannot do it all by ourselves. Oftentimes we're working with allergists, we're working with um, lactation consultants and nurse practitioners and um, osteopathic manipulation medicine docs and myofunctional therapy um, therapists and speech therapists. And so we're working together. I believe that competitive advantage in business is doing what your comp competition is not willing to do. If you can take charge of this and own the airway space in your community, you will create, you will be the go-to reference on all kinds of health related things and attract people who share your values for health. If you're interested in learning more, you can certainly do some reading. Um, I can help you with Total Health Academy where uh, we can do some online training for your entire dental team on your own time. And um, I thank you to all these people who have contributed, Michael Gelb, Howie Hinden, James Nestor, Sharon Moore, Rich Baxter, um, Stephen Park. We, I mean, these are all amazing resources for us. And so you're seeing a lot more of this come on the market and you'll see more and more. Shereen, my friend Shereen Lim is doing a new book and I love Kelly Richardson's book for little kids, you know, the very stuffy nose. And I, I just believe there's no such thing as other people's children. And I know you believe that too, or you wouldn't be on here tonight. So I'm, I'm super grateful for you, Lauren, for all that you put together. And I wanted to leave my cell number and my email address in case people have questions that don't get answered tonight. Or if you're listening and you're not live and you're listening later and you want to reach me, my, cell, my email address is susan at drsusanmaples.com. And I'd, I'd love to hear from you or text me. Okay. Wonderful. Well, that was amazing. And thank you so much for sharing your expertise and passion. We do have a lot of questions. So why don't, um, let's stop yeah, sharing I'm on here. the screen yeah. so we can see you nice up close and personal. <laughs> and right. then I'll, I'll dive right in because we have a bunch of questions and I'm so happy everyone took the time to, to ask them. A lot of these questions you did actually answer, but um, how do you successfully talk to doctors who don't seem to understand, especially ENT? So let's say you give them the, the letters. How do you go to that next level of communication effectively? I think get on the phone, but a lot of times they're really busy. I find that by they're required to read letters about their own patients. So I'm not writing them a letter saying, let me educate you. I'm writing them a letter about my patient saying, let me tell you, here are the symptoms, here are the signs, here's what we've done, here's what I recommend. Um, I send the parents to, of course, if we find one, I send them to them to have these conversations. Um, I think that they're coming along. There are more tonsils and adenoids taken for airway problems than for chronic tonsillitis these days. But, um, you know, it's tricky. They, they worry about bleeding risks, not during the procedure itself. They can control that. They worry about it when the scabs come off a week later. So there is a... Um, you know, there is a concern on their part. They want to, you know, less is more when it comes to surgery. No parent wants their child under and having their tonsils and adenoids removed, but it is um, important. And I think that um, and using these letters to educate, not just our pediatric ENTs, but pediatricians across the board, they mm -hmm. really get pushed back on even like functional frenulplasty and phrenectomy in infants. And um, you know, they're basically telling kids it's normal. And when a child shows up in their office, if they have congestion in their nose, they often blame it on a, a virus and say, oh, it'll pass. Never mind the fact that it took the parent four weeks of this congestion to even think about getting them in there. And so it could be a chronic situation they're not dealing with, or they send them to an allergist for allergy testing rather than doing a food elimination diet where they can take all the allergens out see if the child's congestion gets better and start to in, introduce one at a time to see the culprit. So those are things that parents can learn and we can teach them. And we can tell the pediatrician through letters how we helped identify the food allergies so they can learn better. 
And as clinicians, should it be a, an office protocol to refer to an allergy specialist or allow the pediatrician or the ENT to decide if necessary? I think it's important to know an allergy specialist and to be able to talk to them about that. Um, I think you can do it directly. There's no reason we can't be referring our patients directly across the board to medical specialists. And I do it all the time. Um, there are some insurances that require a primary to be able to make that referral. But rather than doing spot testing for allergies, for foods, I really like the patient to have an experience of removing all inflammatory foods and having the parent go through the exercise of that to see if it helps. And then again, introduce the things one at a time to see if that creates the congestion. And I would say number one is probably dairy. Number two is wheat. A lot of kids have problems with dairy and dairy causes a lot of congestion for all of us. Not for me necessarily, but for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. It isn't natural to switch from human milk to cow's milk. We do it and many of us have done it well and done it successfully. And if you don't overdo it, is we do develop allergies to many of the things that we consume the most. So what are your, what are your thoughts on seasonal allergies and effects on nasal breathing? So that's again, an autoimmune deficiency that we're not able to fight those allergens. That's why we see it so much more. So again, I think seasonal allergies have never been worse. And why is that? Do we have more allergens out there? No, it's because we have less host immune response because we have autoimmune deficiency. So again, the number one way you can do that is increase our diversity of food, stay away from over sanitizing your world um, to try to build up more bugs. We have a, a great hope that probiotics are gonna work. But if you think about the human gut, we have um, three and a half pounds of bacteria living in us, right? Just in our gut. And so a little tiny probiotic is a drop in the bucket. So it, we can't expect to take it from a pill. We can certainly enhance the gut microbiome by good high level probiotics, but we can't expect to just have a pill change it all for us. We need to change the way we're eating. We need to stop being hoodwinked by manufactured food. We are literally being manipulated by food manufacturers. If you're buying food from a box or a bag, or a can or a package or a frozen package, just stop. Mm -hmm. Take the time to eat real food right, and serve right. real food to your kids. And it's never too late. Right? No. It's never too late. You want to eat meat that's been humanely treated. When I say that, I'm not thinking about their psyche right now. I'm thinking about yeah. animals that had a chance to get out in the sun and eat a blade of grass and stretch their legs and see the outside because indoor animals that are constantly inside packed in they are peppered full of antibiotics and steroids for a quick fattening and a quick kill. And those are animals that are not healthy. And if you eat unhealthy animals, you too will be unhealthy. So we don't really want antibiotic. Uh, we want grass fed, um, antibiotic free, steroid free animals that it, it'll say right on there, humanely treated. Are there any telltale signs you can share between knowing if a child has allergies or obstructive sleep apnea? Um, the obstructive sleep apnea, so it's not one or the other, right? We develop obstructions. You think of anything mechanical. Um, so tonsils and adenoids, the tongue, the lowering. So um, it's not one or the other. The question is, how can you tell if it's allergies creating the congestion? Mm -hmm. It's not easy to do. If they're a mouth breather, again, we can get this nasal disuse. If your mouth taping and they're able to breathe through their nose and they're still getting congested, a lot of times it's allergies. Um, again, you can work with their pediatrician, can work with their allergist. I always try to connect them with my, um, I have a anti-inflammatory nutritionist named um, uh, Mary Beth uh, Greeling, or G-R-I-E-L-I-N-G-E-R, -E -E Inspire Wellness. And she's she does everything virtually and she's amazing. If you wanna go through it as a dental team and do a food elimination diet and experience what it feels like to get rid of all the inflammation of your, in your body and identify your own food sensitivities, you'll know how easy it is to do within three weeks for any human. And it's not an easy thing to do because you have to change what you're doing. But if you're willing to do that for a few weeks, you can find these things without an allergy test. 
This is an interesting question. What is the prevalence of allergies in mouth breathers versus nose breathers? And again, really? what comes oh, no. first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> You know what I love about doing something like a podcast where you get these questions is whoever asked that question, it's a good stimulus for more research. Right, right. You know, Sarush Zaghi is always asking, what is it you want to learn? Because they can do the studies. You know, um, I think that is a really, really good question, Lauren. Can you tell it to me again so I can write it sure. down? Sure. It's what is the prevalence of allergies in mouth breathers versus nose breathers? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'd love to see it. Maybe hotline uh, Dr. Zaghi, right? <laughs> Code red. I was just with him last week and I was talking to him about allergies because I will actually do that. And yes. which interventions are within the scope a dentist is asking? In the scope of dentistry? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't do my own tonsillectomies and adenoid mm -hmm. Other than that, it's all there. We are, you know, the ADA and uh, the ADA and the AAPD and the AAPDA or um, American Academy of Pediatrics. Everybody is looking at dentistry as the uh, gatekeeper um, for screening. And if you don't want to uh, do the work, you at least need to identify these things because it is it is our professional and legal responsibility now to be doing an airway exam on kids. Um, and if you want to treat it, you can learn it. Um, Bill Hang teaches a really nice course on early pedo. I don't think it's all about expansion. I think that is an amazing thing to be able to alter the transverse width of a palate and to be able to increase the forward face growth and development at the same time. But I do think that we need to pay attention to all of it Love because it. Mm -hmm. um, sleep Disordered breathing is not the only reason kids are robbed of sleep. It can be sleep hygiene, it can be gaming, it can be staying up late and watching scary movies and moms getting home late from work and it's the only time they ever have to be with their kids and they want to put a nice meal on and they're keeping the kids up till 11 at night. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why kids get sleep deprivation and growth and development issues. But in terms of airway, um, I think most of it is in, within our realm if you want to learn it. Um, all of my hygienists are trained in myofunctional therapy, all of them, which means if they don't want to practice myofunctional therapy, they can at least recognize muscle dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And then we can, you know, one hygienist in particular likes practicing it, but it's a, it is something that I think we all should be able to get more and more involved in. And I'm not a pediatric dentist. I'm a general dentist, but some of my pediatric dental friends in the Endeavor group practice purely pediatric airway, no handpiece in their hands, no drilling, no cavities, just airway. And they're building flourishing businesses around it. What do you do with a five-year-old who has a small nose and tiny nares? Um, small nose on the outside or the inside? Well, let's say, why don't you try both? <laughs> because I don't know, they weren't so specific. The nares are the openings. And those typically don't matter as much as what we see with the turbinates overgrowth. And again, I think um, we can use an ENT to help us. A lot of times they'll prescribe uh, uh, Flonase to try to reduce the, the steroid to a, steroid, a steroidal anti-inflammatory to reduce the the um, inflammation, but you saw with Finn, he was probably five. I would at least, you know, once a week during heavy congestion times, I would do that nasal rinsing. I would be spraying with um, the xylitol and then mouth taping, especially during story time and then nap time and then all night long. Mouth taping is easy. As long as a five-year-old is very easy, you can whip it off. Um, again, training the tongue to be up and out of that airway and tra training nasal breathing. And then Definitely expansion for four and five year olds. Um, mm -hmm. Why are we starting so late when we can we can basically steer clear of orthodontics and help a kid breathe better and help their brain develop better and help them pay better attention in school and have better moods? So, um, if you're interested in that, I I personally think most orthodontists aren't trained for it, don't want to do it, they don't want to do it under the age of six. That's falling into the hands of the airway student general dentists like me. I agree. Uh, what kind of comprehensive test should we ask for from the allergist? And what is the most effective and safest way to treat an allergy if diagnosed in terms of nasal sprays prescriptions besides clear? I really don't know that. Mm -hmm. I am frustrated with the way Western uh, medicine drugs a kid. And, you know, for mm -hmm. me, I had 
um, two allergy shots a week growing up. And I was constantly in the allergist's office and had to avoid, and I had every kind of medication you could put in your body for allergies and none of it worked for me. And I slept with a vaporizer with medicine. I was an overly medicated kid who got heavy and sedentary and, and was told not to play outside. And it was exactly opposite of what I needed. Uh, when I started to be able to exercise my own lungs and get real exercise and eat better um, and sleep better. And, you know, my allergies all went away within three years of working with, um, with someone who knew better. So I, I'm not a huge fan, but again, I think it's important to, to know natural paths in your community, to know uh, integrated medicine docs, you know, functional medicine docs. I have, I'm sitting in my dining room right now, this dining room table holds 12 people and I have a wellness and prevention study club who meets here once a month. And we've been doing that for like um, seven years. And we have a very diverse group of physicians and we talk about these things. And there's so much I don't know, Lauren, there's so much yeah. each of us don't know, but collectively we know more and uh, we can grapple with these things. We can grapple with antibiotics and vaccination schedules and all these things with kids. Why are we why are we antibioticing them to death? You know, one of my team members just had um, a little girl who they are suspicious that she has viral pneumonia. They put her on antibiotic. And I said, why did they put her on antibiotic? Was it just in case it was a bacterial pneumonia? She said, my kid needs this. Like parents oftentimes are arguing for it, right? right. And it's, it's okay. It's okay. An antibiotic isn't the end of the world, but it's the overuse of antibiotics. And chronically sick kids like me had them all the time which did nothing but hurt their autoimmune system. Now, did you think by becoming a dentist, you'd be saving the world <laughs> when you first went to dental school? I don't you think know, I'm saving think the world. That. I wish no, I would. I know in my lifetime, in my lifetime, I will not <laughs> probably make a dent in the decline in the human condition right now. It's really sad and COVID's been really sad, but I do know that I, um, I can't help but want to help. And, you know, at 62 years old, I feel like a lot of energy for this. And I know I'll be at it for a long time. And I'm grateful to have the energy and stamina uh, that was given to me at a young age and to steer clear of this. I wouldn't be here without the help of one really good astute physician who helped me earn my health back. And, I, and I'm going to pay it forward as long as I can and, and hope to make a difference. You know, well, yeah, you are. That's for sure. We have another question in the chat. After expansion in a seven-year-old, what is average time frame for myofacial therapy, and can it be done virtually if none locally? You can do it before seven. You can do it after seven. So I like the idea of doing myofunctional therapy when the expander comes out because now you have a a tongue a box that's bigger and you can teach the tongue out of there. But the tongue is amazingly powerful. Sixteen muscles that come together and. And doing myofunctional therapy, if you were serious about using your tongue to try to do some of that expansion, if a child knew how to do that, it would make a big difference. Um, and we certainly need to teach the tongue to support that new tongue box. Uh, but myofunctional therapy can begin as soon as, you know, there are really astute occupational therapists, SLPs that do it in infants. But we certainly, once we start to get a child who's able to follow instructions and parents who are committed, we can certainly see it in two and three-year-olds even. So early on, yeah. And um, Sharon Moore is asking, in your opinion, what is the best way to help parents understand why to start the airway health journey? Oh my gosh, Sharon. <laughs> well, she's like one of my heroes. So I really like you to ask her how she would answer. Okay, it. well, I know I can't do that. But, um, Sharon, if you're on, uh, I would love to have you on <laughs> conversations one day. Repeat the question again. Sure. It is, in your opinion, what is the best way to help parents understand why to start the airway health journey? Um, you know, Sharon, I quoted her in the Brave Parent book kind of about this subject because we all have trouble. And Sharon was saying, you know, parents want their kids to look like them. So when they start to have facial dysfunction or disformity, they think it's genetic and you mm. don't want to tell them, you know, can't you see this? Because you're basically saying your child's not cute enough. So you're really wanting them to be curious about what have they noticed and um, especially in behavior issues and things that they're frustrated with um, and to start to ask questions about, you know, I'm recognizing some signs here um, that go with the symptoms you're talking about, 
are you interested in knowing more and sort of piquing their curiosity? Mm -hmm. I wish I could open the book and read her quote right now because she's really um, been such an influencer for me. Her book, Sleep Wreck Kids, is just incredible. But we are all um, hard pressed to describe this in a way that parents understand it. You know, we're teaching this to dentists and they have a full acumen of our, you know, of our, they have a full uh, vocabulary of our language. Mm -hmm. So how do we describe it? And that's really my prime, one of the primary reasons I wrote the great parent book was to try to explain to parents about what airway dysfunction is about. And then also what sleep related breathing disorders, separating those two. Um, but when I put that first, that that was going to be the first chapter Rob Lustig, one of my good friends who was an early reader said, that's going to snow people. That's, you just start out with what they already know, which was food, okay. right? right. About well, I also love how you write when you credit Dr. Zapp is that a brave parent doesn't have to be the birth parent at all. Really, it can be anyone who sees the child's wellness better than they can at any given moment. And I love that line because that can be the dentist, that can be the hygienist, that can be the myofunctional therapist, that can be anyone who can take that child's life and elevate it with utilizing their knowledge. So kudos to you um, for this book, everybody. It's, I love how you say it really should be a manual. You know, my kids are older, like yours, 27, 25, 21. I wish I had this, <laughs> you know, when they were one, actually zero. I find of, that when parents read it, they're really healing themselves too, mm -hmm. because we yeah. often didn't get parented the way we wanted to in certain areas and we can fix things. And our kids are watching us all the time. I, so we have to do it with them. Exactly. And like Dr. Boyd says, they're natural imitators, right? They are, they just yeah. want to imitate and they just want to please. So, um, I'm just going to put this up again so people can see uh, your book again. And hopefully this will come up. You can, it's also on Audible. I had a nice time reading it for Audible. And a lot of people, especially Melinda. Oh, I didn't know that because I do my walking. I try to exercise, like you said, the movement. Yeah. A lot <laughs> it's of people very are important. enjoying it on Audible right now. Yeah. And question for you. I know the title is so important for a book uh, and you chose you know two words that stand out can you share how you chose the title um i really think that it's about i my book coach was helpful i came up with the title and she really loved it because it's really not just about knowing what to do it's about having the resolve to do it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's where we you know we know how to we know some healthy foods to feed our kids but we're in the grocery store and we lose our resolve and we bring maybe it home maybe we should write a a book, Brave Dentist or Brave Hygienist. I know, right? <laughs> I know. And I really want to write another book, Brave Parenting, The Emancipating Child, 16 to 30, because I think mm. that's a very tough age for parents to land the hovercraft and know when to get involved and when not to, and, you know, all of that. So, I mean, there's a lot to that bravery, um, but it is, you know, being a good parent does require being a brave parent, right? Yeah. Well, that's the number one ingredient you're saying. And I just love this. This is in, on your website as well um, that I listed earlier that you listed to, to uh, be a brave parent.com. You have some nice information there. So everyone take a look at that. But this is just so clever and so um, simple in a sense, right? It's, it's very, it's nice to have an ingredient and a cookbook to raise a happy, healthy child. We could have all used that growing up. So kudos to you for that. I do just want to share just some um, announcements. I do want to remind everybody about Dr. Gerald Simmons, his uh, dental sleep conference. Um, you know, he's done such an, a remarkable job in, in collaborating with the dental medical community. So if you haven't yet signed up or curious about learning more, visit the dentalsleepconference.com. He'll be in Houston, Texas, along with um, Dr. Boyd, as well as um, and some other really interesting and well-versed people in airway. Uh, we have our mini residency coming up so you can learn Dr. Moralia's uh, tried and true techniques of myofunctional appliances and expansion appliances uh, for children, and then uh, removable expansion appliances for adults as well as clear aligner therapy. So we do have a couple of seats left for our pediatric um, and uh, the May 13th one is almost filled up. So please, if you're interested, find out more and I'm helpful, to, um, uh, happy to help with any questions. We're thrilled that we have another new course with Dr. Michael Gelb on um, treating the TMD patient. This is kind of a, a niche course, if you would. It's getting the patient prepared for orthodontics, for airway orthodontics. So it's Dr. Morali and Dr. Gelb collaborate through the years. And 
we realize that not everybody has Dr. Gell in their back corner. So you can learn Dr. Moralia's uh, techniques. This is a technique course, full day, virtual, May 20th. So please uh, consider joining us. And then we also have an advanced course, uh, June 3rd and June 10th, which is 100% virtual on how to use brackets and wires in an expansive manner, as well as fixed expansion for older and teens. So we're thrilled about that. Um, like Dr. Maple said, we love having um, hygienists do the myofunctional therapy in the dental practice. So we created a course specifically for that. So check out our airwayhealthsolutions.com forward slash Mayo. It's Brittany Sierra and Chris Laguerre. They're wonderful educators. They're so passionate and they really give you that sense of how to get going on Monday morning. So um, we're thrilled to have them on board as well as telehealth myofunctional therapy. Um, reach out to the info at Airway Health Solutions and I will connect you with Brittany. Uh, we love live events. We just had one with Dr. Boyd and it was so great getting together. Um, I know D Dr. Boyd's on the call. So thank you, Dr. Boyd, for a fabulous uh, advanced mini residency. But I'm always asked about team where we have a live team event. So come on down to Nashville, wherever you are. Um, July 8th is Airway Health Solutions Conference and July 9th is Clear Alani Carolina University. It's one fee for the whole week. So um, it's really a great cost-effective way and a great team builder to get your team um, in organically excited about airway health and clear line of therapy in an expansive way. And I am super excited that we are announcing our Airway um, Palooza December 8th and 10th. We don't have registration yet, but we do have our keynote speaker. Um, James Nesser will be joining us uh, on December 10th. He'll be closing out the event. And I'm also super thrilled that we have a star-studded lineup. Um, and thank you, uh, uh, Susan, for joining us. We're so excited for this. But we have Dr. Boyd, Dr. Moralia, Dr. Gelb, Dr. Christensen, Carice and Brittany, Susan, Dr. Gerald Simmons, Dr. Carstensen, I believe you're on the call as well, Dr. Scott Siegel, Dr. Scott Bolding, um, Dr. Scott Province, who's a new Airway Health Solutions dentist. He's going to kind of share his journey and more. So please save the date. We'll be sending out invites to our alumni first, and then we'll open it up for open registration. I am constantly getting asked about our airwayhealthsolutions.com locator, and um, we, we love to have more green dots, especially in the, in the midsection here. We're kind of crowded in the Northeast. Uh, that's where our roots are. So um, I get a lot of requests from patients asking me to find an airway dentist near them. So um, we, we collaborate with each other. And it's great after you take our mini residency and learn the techniques for expansion, you can also get on this map. And you're also eligible to use our airway health aligners, which is specifically designed for expansion. There's no hidden retraction. We don't do any IPR and we don't do any lingual root torque. So you won't have that posterior open bite and you're assured um, an expansive case based on Dr. Moralia's protocols. So uh, join our Airway Dentist Facebook group after you take our course. It's a nice community where we share cases and information. And if for our public group, we have Airway Health Meetup. So please look for us. We'd love to have your input there. And we are in this journey together. Uh, May 4th, our next conversation is with Dr. Ben Moralia. And he's going to kind of demystify brackets and wires because everyone says, oh, I thought brackets and wires are bad. But they're not. There's a time and a place and there's an expansive technique that Dr. Moralia will share with you and show you some great cases. And I think we're going to take a summer break for our conversations, but I said that last year and we didn't. So we'll see what special guests may come up in the summer. But that is a wrap. Um, Dr. Uh, I, I keep calling you Dr. Maples, but Susan, thank, thank you so much for all you do. And please, please, please um, get this book for yourself, for your, it's the great shower gift, by the way, right? A baby shower yeah. gift. Yep. It's like a yeah. nice way to kind of sneak in there. <laughs> yeah. It's probably the gift that keeps giving. Yeah. Um, I do, I just do want to uh, announce that Dr. Bill Hang is on the AAPMD webinar right now. If you wanted to join that, uh, you can get CE for that. We put the link in the chat. So um, there's a lot to learn from Dr. Hang um, also on the subject. So we hope you do that. And Dr. Maples, why don't you just close, close us out with a word of encouragement of how we can truly make a difference. In I, thank you. I also really wanted to mention Collaboration Cures meeting, which is AAPMB and AASH in uh, September 15th through 18th in Scottsdale, Phoenix area. So yes, and we're a proud sponsor of that as well. I'll have to add that on my, <laughs> my list. So can't wait for that. 
Well, I love what you said, Lauren, be a brave dentist, be a brave <laughs> dentist, you know, have these tough conversations. They're not easy sometimes. And when it comes from a place of true caring, their the parents will know and they won't be freaked out. So, you know, just to raise the awareness and keep the conversation going and help them learn is what we're supposed to do. So we'll save yeah. these kids for sure. Thank you for everything you do. And thanks everyone for your time and commitment to better health. We love having you and I'll be hosting as long as you guys keep coming. So until next time, see you. Thanks again. Bye. Bye. Bye.